We're going to get started in just one minute, so if you want to wrap up your conversations and take a seat, thanks. Why don't we start? Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Laura Barkoviak. I'm a member of the International Socialist Organization. I'll be facilitating tonight. Um, I'm excited to introduce the speakers, but first I want to say a few words on why we organized this event and why we think it's important. In July this summer, the New York Times covered a pop-up free clinic in rural southwest Virginia that people camped out for overnight in their cars or in tents, um, hoping to get a spot in line the next morning for free medical services. From dental to vision to basic primary services, they got up at dawn, hoping that they would get the care that they couldn't receive otherwise. What was striking about this piece was not that everyone was uninsured. Many were, but some actually had insurance, but they reported that they simply couldn't afford the co payments or that it wasn't covered by their insurers. So I think while we had a near miss with Trump Care this summer, we're also sev several years into the implementation of Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, and yet we live in a situation where 29 million people are uninsured, where premiums and co-payments are skyrocketing, where people feel like they can't access the care that they need. Um, and we think that there's a better way to do this. Um, we don't have to travel to Appalachia to find such desperate situations. I think that maybe even some people in this room can understand this situation, that there are many similar scenarios closer to home. Um, so while all of this, while all of these um, cases have accumulated, we're in a situation where insurers are reporting record profits that would make bankers jealous. Um, so this is an incredible turnout tonight and thank everyone for tuning in at home. So I will also wanna go through the co-sponsors and thank them. We have Physicians for a National Health Program, the New York Metro chapter, NYC for abortion rights. Yes. Um, Science for the People, NYC. Democratic Socialists of America, Femini Socialist Feminist Working Group, <laughs> Campaign for New York Health, Jacobin Magazine, Bay Ridge for Social Justice. And thank you to Verso for letting us use your beautiful space. And thank you to Jacobin, Socialist Worker, and the Brooklyn ISO page for s live streaming this. So an overview of how it's going to work. We're going to hear from each speaker for about five to 10 minutes, so 40 minutes. And then we're going to open it up for discussion and then at the end, we'll have each speaker come back in for about five minutes. Um, with that, I'll introduce our first speaker. Dr. Oliver Fine is uh, the current chair of the New York chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program, the New York Metro chapter, and a practicing general internist and a teacher at Cornell Medical College. So please welcome Dr. Fine. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I was asked to not talk about policy uh, so much, so I will not talk about, at least initially, uh, a Medicare for All, improved Medicare for All single payer program, but you can ask me questions about that. And I will not discuss our New York Health Act, which is an attempt to try to create a single payer state program. But I was asked
and interestingly, over 77% of those people had health insurance at the outset of their bankrupting illness. The health insurance just didn't cover what they needed. Now, the next set of slides deals with this issue of poor outcomes. Uh, in this uh, study by Andy Wilper, it is estimated that in 2015, uh, roughly 28,949 uh, deaths were due to the lack of health insurance. Um, so that's not a great quality system, right? Uh, but when you look at us in terms of life expectancy compared to the other industrialized nations in the world, we have the lowest life expectancy, the highest infant mortality rate, and really, truly, embarrassingly, uh, the highest mortal, uh, maternal mortality rate, such that it is twice what is in the UK and close to uh, seven times what it is in Australia. But we have the highest cost system. Uh, and here you see that back in 1980, we started uh, together with the rest of the pack of industrialized nations in terms of our health care costs as a percent of the gross domestic product. Yeah, we were the most expensive back then, but look at what's happened. They have also increased as technology has increased in medicine. Uh, the costs have increased, but what's happened is that we have gone really out uh, so that we are now twice what most other industrialized nations, and even some, three times what some uh, cost. Uh, well, what's that due to? Well, maybe the problem is that, uh, you know, Americans stay in the hospital too long, right? But look at this. We have the fewest days per person per year of the industrialized nation. Well, maybe that means that everybody's getting ambulatory care, outpatient care. But look at this. We have the lowest number of physician visits per capita to the doctor or the nurse practitioner. Uh, well, maybe it's the problem that we have too many old people, right? You know. Uh, but look at this. Uh, you know, we've got the lowest number percent of old people compared to look at Japan up there one quarter of their population is over 65, right? And yet their system doesn't cost what ours does. Well, clearly, Americans smoke too much, right? But look at this, you know, <laughs> compared to other industrialized nations there in France, uh, they're smoking almost <laughs> twice as much as we do. Well, maybe the problem uh, is, if I can get back to that slide, that we pay our doctors too much. And what that slide would have shown you is that there are other countries that actually pay their doctors more than we do. Um, I think that, I'd like to get back, yeah, this slide begins to capture what I think is really one of the major explanations. Here you see the number of doctors in the yellow bar and how that has gone up from 1970 to 2016. But look at what's happened to the number of administrators and managers in the system. We need to amputate that group. <laughs> Give them meaningful work instead of pushing papers and denying claims. Uh, that's what we really ought to be about. And what you see here is in terms of health insurance administrative costs per capita, we are just, again, twice as much of the most expensive other uh, system in the world. Uh, and then if you take that down to the provider level, what you find is, you know, hospital administrative costs, roughly 25% of all spending in hospitals goes to administration, coding, trying to maximize billing, decreasing the length of stay, what have you. Uh, whereas if you went up to Canada, it would be half that in their single payer system. So uh, administrative costs, I think, are one of the profound explanations 
for the high cost of our system. And then, of course, you have the private insurance uh, industry. Uh, and here you see uh, the top executives, uh, Michael Nydorf at Centene, uh, earning, you know, $20 million in a year. That means on a, uh, a, work, a five day work week, every day he is getting $80,000. That is, in fact, obscene, right? <laughs> so, those are some of the problems that I think we need to address with healthcare reform. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping the rest of our panel begin to think about some of those things, and if we don't address them, that you will ask questions about, as I say, uh, a single payer program, both statewide and national wide. So thank you very much. Great. Um, next, we have Megan Lassard, who works to develop and evaluate community-based public health initiatives in the Bronx. She's on the NYC for Abortion Rights Coordinating com Committee. Please welcome Megan. So I don't have any impressive data visuals, unfortunately, so you just have to bear with me in my kind of didactic spiel. <laughs> So I'd like to start by quoting sociologist Dorothy Roberts from a recent article she wrote for Dissent Magazine. Reproductive justice activists treat abortion and other reproductive health services as akin to the resources all human beings are entitled to, such as health care, education, housing, and food in an equitable, democratic society. Roberts calls for a profound shift in the way we think about abortion from a framework of choice and all its neoliberal trappings to one of justice and rights. This is already happening with the conversation about universal coverage. People are starting to talk less about healthcare as if it were a luxury handbag and more like something we deserved just for existing. We need to start doing the same for abortion. Drawing from Roberts and other reproductive justice activists I argue that any vision for a single-payer system that excludes or elides reproductive health care isn't truly grounded in the principles of social justice. But I don't want to dwell too much in the abstract. The following two testimonies from ordinary people in states where abortion is heavily restricted might give you some idea of what it's like to live in a world where abortion isn't considered a public good or even legitimate medical care. I called Dallas, I called San Antonio. I think in Austin and here in Waco, they weren't doing nothing. And they said they didn't have a surgeon or a doctor for that here. They used to have one. I don't know what happened, but they didn't have one at the time. I also did look at ways that I could do it myself at home, but it was like, either you do it, you hurt yourself, or you might, you know, hurt the baby. I call back and I think they told me that they weren't doing the procedure, that the government had put a stop to it or something. I was pretty upset, but I just decided that I guess I'll have to just ride it out. I didn't know what else to do or who else to call. And another. When I found out I was pregnant, I just started sobbing. The doctor slipped me some cards for clinics in different states. She couldn't be pro-choice publicly. We live in a very religious area in West Virginia, but she knew that I couldn't keep taking my meds during a pregnancy. So we drove three and a half hours to Maryland so we could get it done in one day and not miss work. Outside, nuns prayed. Protesters threw themselves on their knees with holy water. I wish these accounts were from the dark days before 1973, but both took place within the last five years. And there are millions more stories like these, of families forced to choose between paying the heating bill and terminating a first trimester pregnancy, of a 12-year-old rape survivor squaring off in court against a lawyer representing her fetus, of the two-day waiting periods and the gauntlets of pro-lifers blocking the entrance to the state's last freestanding clinic. Roe v. Wade hasn't been overturned yet, but for so many people in this country, exercising choice requires an effort so Herculean 
It would fray the bootstraps of even the most hardcore of libertarians. We've, come, we've somehow come to accept that poor and working class people and young people and people of color and undocumented people and queer people will just be collateral damage in the struggle for choice. Congress has reauthorized the Hyde Amendment every year since 1976, when the provision first went into effect to block federal Medicaid funding for abortion. More recently, and in supposedly more progressive times, President Obama cut a deal with anti-abortion Democrats to secure the passage of the Affordable Care Act, issuing an executive order that maintains current Hyde Amendment restrictions governing abortion policy and extends those restrictions to the newly created health insurance exchanges. Currently, 31 states exclude or limit abortion coverage within plans on their insurance exchanges. And all state exchanges are required to offer at least one, one multi-state plan that excludes ab abortion coverage. And this is true even in New York, where state funding can subsidize abortion. Fidelis Care, a safety net insurer formed by the state's Catholic diocese in 1997, excludes abortion and all forms of birth control besides counseling for natural family planning from its marketplace and its Medicaid plans. With 1,204,688 enrollees, Fidelis' Medicaid managed care plan is the largest in New York. So sure, you can choose your insurance company that will manage your coverage, but what kind of choice is that if you're living in a rural county upstate and the only insurance company on offer is Fidelis Care? So we've gotten to the point where liberal lawmakers sacrifice the reproductive freedom of those with the least to begin with as if it were perfunctory, just a toll to pay on the freeway towards a bigger, more important goal. When Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee Chairman Ben Ray Lujan recently said that abortion rights wouldn't be a litmus test for Democratic candidates, maybe he wasn't thinking about what it would be like to recover from surgery on the back of a Greyhound bus. Yet, with universal, universal coverage itself becoming a litmus test for both liberals and leftists, the logic behind excluding one type of health care from the medical mainstream is really starting to erode. Would we tolerate the dehumanization that people experience trying to access abortion for any other medical issue? What if we substituted the word cancer for abortion? We drove three and a half hours to Maryland so we could get the chemotherapy done in one day and miss less work. I just decided that I guess I'll have to ride the cancer out. The doctor said they don't do tumor removals in this state. We have the opportunity right now to put together a vision for a radically different approach to healthcare, one anchored in justice rather than markets. But if abortion and reproductive health care aren't an explicit part of the single payer agenda, we risk replicating the, this, the worst parts of a very broken system. We must call for nothing less than a complete repeal of the Hyde Amendment and its state level analogs. And an end to religious exemptions that impede our access to care. What happened in Colorado last year should serve as a cautionary tale. While lawmakers were successful in getting an initiative for a statewide single-payer system on the ballot, Amendment 69 failed to address a 1984 state law that prohibits the use of public funds for abortion, except in the rarest of circumstances. Mainstream reproductive rights organizations like NARAL Colorado ultimately opposed the initiative because they feared it would restrict abortion coverage for everybody enrolled in the program, which potentially would have been the entire state. And for the record, the initiative failed to pass. We can't allow two progressive causes to be pitted against each other because both sides are going to end up losing. And if you think about it, they are the same side. Healthcare is a right and abortion is health care, goes the mantra. And choice? I'd like to consign the term to the back of the medicine cabinet with the daiquiri-flavored condoms, just an ill-advised purchase <laughs> from a night not worth returning to.
Thank you. Next, we have Dustin Guastella, who's a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, and he's written about healthcare activism at Jacobin Magazine. He's also a graduate student in sociology at Rutgers University. Please welcome, welcome Dustin. Hey, everybody. So I think Medicare for All healthcare could be won in the next six years if we're smart. And to that end, I'm going to try to talk about three things that I think we need to do as part of a movement to make Medicare for All a reality. The first thing is we need to be involved in a nationally coordinated strategy and campaign to push for federal level demands. The second thing, I think we need to expand the political imagination of workers, students, and voters, and whoever may be the mass base of the Medicare for All movement, such that they are invested in a set of political principles and not just a single piece of legislation or a slogan. Thirdly, I think we need to employ mass tactics and mass action with the goal of raising the political profile of our demand and raising the political costs on politicians who don't support it. I think if we do these things, we can cohere a Medicare for All block that is strong enough to create the issue, that, to make the issue such a lightning rod political moment in, in the coming years that no politician can avoid it and no politician can deny support for it. So I think all of you are here because you support the demand for Medicare for All. It's a proactive working class demand. It requires removing a major service from the market and guaranteeing as a social right health care to all. Nurses love it, students love it, Bernie loves it, voters love it. It's a perfect candidate, I think, for socialist politics. But what's less clear is why we may need a national strategy and a nationally coordinated campaign. Single-payer legislation has been introduced in a few state houses, including in New York. And it's true some of these bills have legs, New York and California, the two most prominent ones. And some advocates have argued that the way to single-payer, the way to Medicare for All, is through these state houses. If we follow Canadian history, they say this is how we can win the legislation. It'll spread like wildfire across the country. Yet, I think the federalized nature of the U.S. state system presents some major barriers to progressive politics especially those with expensive price tags. Local efforts are often obstructed by federal law, and local legislators are more, more often than not hamstring by budgetary constraints. For small states and poorer states, single payer is much less sound economically and more politically vulnerable to sabotage. An exclusively state-based strategy will absolutely leave poorer and more rural states, especially those in the South, behind. Most state-level single payer plans rely heavily on the existing Medicaid and Medicare and child, uh, children's health insurance funds provided to the state from the federal government. These plans integrate these federal funds into their state systems to make them workable. Yet these federal programs themselves are under attack by both private insurance industry lobbyists and Republican and Democratic Party conservatives. So even if in some states we're able to win single payer, if they have the political will and the economic capacity to make it happen, the federal government can still hold veto power over these plans by, by pulling the funding from Medicare and Medicaid and CHIP. By contrast, the universality of a national Medicare for All campaign is both politically smart and economically feasible. The strength of single payer is in its size. The larger the risk pool, the cheaper the coverage. By expanding Medicare to encompass all residents, we would dramatically expand and diversify our risk pool thus driving health insurance costs down and allowing us to better negotiate with drug companies to keep costs low. And we'd be doing all this while using an existing federal program. What's more, there's currently some $375 billion in unnecessary annual costs from the existing multi-payer system. These redundant administrative costs would disappear under a unified and universal federal single-payer system. But I think the most compelling reason to fight for a national-level campaign with nationwide coordination is a political one. Our only strength as socialists is popular working class pressure. And the best way to make use of that strength is to convene and work among the already active layer of healthcare pressure groups and workers' organizations across the country. National coordination among organizations like the Physicians for a National Health Insurance Program, the Labor Campaign for Single Payer, those supportive unions in healthcare, education and communication sectors, the post-Sanders groups like Nina Turner's Our Revolution and Labor for Bernie, not to mention my own organization, which is now a nearly 30,000 member strong and has made Medicare for All its number one priority in the coming years. 
I think the left's own recent history shows that thinking big and working toward these broad national level demands alongside mass working class organizations is how we best develop our political clarity and put, build a nationwide presence. Remember, this is what we want. State level bills are a road toward Medicare for all. And we want the ab abolition of private health insurance. We want free universal health care for all. That kind of vision can only be fulfilled through the power of a federal government. Of course, most organizing for any national reform comes at the state and local level. And there are currently really good state bills in New York and California that seem viable. So how might we be able to advocate for the kind of national strategy I'm pushing for while not hamstringing those local initiatives? I think one way of thinking about this is for advocating for a, a set of health care principles as the core and the bedrock of this campaign. As I mentioned before, our role as socialists right now is to expand the nationwide political imagination such that we can solidify a consensus on universal health care as a social right. We don't simply want to stoke enthusiasm for this or that legislation introduced under the banner of universal health care, and we can't blindly support any legislation introduced by any popular democratic legislators. Instead, we want Medicare for all, and we want a political bloc that can articulate exactly what their demands are. What is a health system that works for workers? And I think on this point, we want everyone in our campaign to confidently and stridently demand five things. One, a single program, not a patchwork. Two, comprehensive coverage. That means inpatient, outpatient, drugs, uh, dental, optical, long-term care, and full reproductive care. Three, we want free at the point of service care, financed through tax contributions based on the ability to pay and not shifting costs onto the sick. That means no co-pays, no deductibles, and no cost sharing on the consumer side. Four, we want universal coverage for all US residents, non-citizens included. And five, we want a jobs program. We want to replace these, the, what will become redundant jobs in the insurance industry, and we want some severance for those affected by the transition. The benefits to articulating a set of demands like this are far reaching. Demands allow us to express a political vision independent of any legislation. They, they also allow us to create public interest and enthusiasm around a set of political ideals and not just a set of policy initiatives. Through the constant repetition of these sorts of principles, we can both advocate for our politics and help develop a coherent political project while avoiding the pitfalls of detailed policy debates on a given piece of legislation. Further, by focusing on demands like this, we can force legislators who may or may not be in a position to vote for such a law to take a strong position on Medicare for all, not on a piece of legislation, but on the principles that inform the policy. This programmatic approach gives us the flexibility to take firm positions on this or that legislation. It allows us to articulate exactly what our vision is at every door and in every neighborhood. And with these demands, we can set the gold standard for single payer. By emphasizing socialist political principles, we're able to be in the best position to organize around a robust vision for single-payer health care among the broadest sector of sympathetic workers, students, and voters. And this is exactly what we need to do if we want to win. Now, finally, I want to talk about raising political costs and mass action, right? The way we're going to win single-payer is by pressuring our political elite. Now, our political elite are primarily responsible not to their constituents, but to those billionaires that make sure their re-elections are possible. So if we want to defeat them, if we want them to flip, we need them to reassign themselves from representatives of corporations and the industry lobbyists to representatives of the people. And the only way to do that is to generate political costs through mass political action. By cohering a militant base of trade unionists, students, workers, voters, and especially the post-Sanders trend, the some hundreds of thousands of politically active people and millions of Sanders voters out there, we can turn this issue into a lightning rod issue whereby no politician can meet the demand with anything less than praise. And I think this is where socialists can play a unique role. Unlike other progressive organizations, we're uniquely positioned to politically threaten legislators in a way that many local unions or liberal organizations can't. A local union, for instance, may be dependent on their state speaker's vote for a certain labor legislation. Socialists have no such commitments. We're able to mobilize thousands to build the infrastructure and the on-the-ground organizational components that can target these legislators in their home districts, wherever they are, and we can use our networks of tens of thousands across the country, Sanderistas, workers, nurses, and students, to popularize the demand and organize everywhere. Medicare for All, I think, is the leading demand that can help reignite a mass political bloc for working class politics. And making this issue, our right, 
to help our demand for single payer, the center of the political debate for the next two years is our job. As socialists, it's time for us to step up and take the lead because the Democratic Party continues to drag its feet on an issue that has explosive political potential for the left. We can be the political pole that draws people in and the force that helps cohere a new militant mass base for working class politics. So I encourage you all to join us in the fight for a health care system good enough for the working class. It's a fight we intend to win. Thank you. And finally, there's Sean Petty, who is a registered nurse and serves on the New York State Nurses Association Board of Directors. He's also a member of the International Socialist Organization. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, spend my, most of my time talking about um, kind of what political moment we're in because it's, it, it can be very, um, I think, challenging to navigate. Um, I think if we take a longer look at the past year and, and look at what you know, the Sanders campaign brought to politics in this country and now what we're having to deal with, I think it can be very jarring and very difficult to, to figure out um, what's possible. Uh, because on the one hand, um, uh, I th I'm going to argue that uh, single payer uh, is in uh, the best possibility of, of, of winning than it, than it has been uh, since Medicaid and Medicare um, were, were initiated in the early 60s. Um, on the other hand, Donald Trump's our president. Um, and so, and um, you know, just in the last week, we have, right in the last hour, we have a major climate change induced storm uh, uh, hammering Puerto Rico. Uh, we had another one a week ago that decimated the, um, one of the fourth largest city in this country. Um, and um, just in the last week, we now have uh, 800,000 um, undocumented immigrants who are um, facing deportation uh, in six months' time. And so I think, you know, we can, we, it can be very, um, how do those two things sit with each other? Um, how, do, how does that, how do we negotiate that terrain? Because I think a lot of us feel that there's a range of really existential crises that uh, people are feeling in different ways. I mean, the, the summer, uh, the fight around Trump care, I mean, if Trump care were to have passed, you're talking about not just 30 million people losing health care coverage uh, in, in a few years' time, you're talking about the decimation of what's left of the public hospital systems in this country. Uh, you were talking, of course, about the immediate elimination of funding from Planned Parenthood and the, what's left, left of abortion access in this country. Um, and I think that the fact that we were able to push back uh, on that while also not um, just saying we want the old status quo, because I think one of the unique things about the defense of the Affordable Care Act, which is an incredibly flawed piece of legislation and, a, and, a, and an approach to the health care system, I think was that for the first time we were able to defend what we have but also put forward a vision of, of what we wanted. And there were single payer activists in that fight uh, on, the, on the ground making that argument successfully to a whole range of activists. And there's a whole range of organizations that are, that are now open to that argument in a way that they weren't uh, six months uh, uh, to a year ago. Um, so I think that, you know, the whole idea that many people can feel like all that we can accomplish right now is just to stop the bleeding actually um, is, not, is not really where people are at. I think actually people are really open in, in a way that we haven't seen before towards fighting for what we want, not just um, what, what, not just stopping what is immediately uh, attacking us in the given moment. So I think that's a really important uh, dynamic to recognize about this political moment. Um, I think that's re been very much reflected in the single payer movement. In January, uh, a number of forces came together, uh, National Nurses United, New York State Nurses Association, many of the other unions involved in the labor campaign for single payer, Healthcare Now, PNHP, and basically did lay out a perspective of um, you can't fight the right from the middle. Trump is elected. Um, the, what the Sanders campaign and the Hillary defeat showed was that you can't you know, win against the right by saying America is already great. 
um, and, that, and that the status quo is okay and that we have to actually fight for the things that we want. And that's how you're gonna galvanize people. That's how Sanders galvanized hundreds of thousands of people to fight for his major, one of his major campaign slogans, which was single payer healthcare. And that is why we've seen explosive growth of organizations like the DSA um, and other social organizations like mine where, um, and, and I, I just find it really striking that, you know, uh, a, a group like the DSA, 20, 20 to 30,000 members, most of that growth is, you know, people the age of 20 to 30 years old, people who utilize healthcare at the lowest level in the entire country. Their number one issue is single payer healthcare and Medicare for all. That's a really profound development um, because if you've been involved in the single payer movement, uh, like Dr. Fine and myself for the last, you know, 50, it's, you know, it's getting a little gray in the in the in the hair a little bit. It has, it's a little. <laughs> It's been a little, uh, you know, and, and that makes sense, right? Who are the people that, are, you know, life and death depend on, you know, having good access to health care. It's usually the higher health care utilizers, which are generally uh, older and poorer people. Um, so, but, but, that, but that's just a profound, I think, uh, shift. And I think it says something about the political uh, possibilities. Um, I think that, so I, I, I do think we we're seeing the biggest opening for single payer uh, in, in 50 years. I think that the signs of it are the Bernie Sanders campaign. I mean, in the New York State, the state-based campaigns, and, and it's important not to overstate this, but the fact that given how even the small amount of forces that have been pushing those, those bills, the fact that they came both in, in the two of the three largest states in the country, New York and California, that they came within a couple of votes of getting to their respective governor's desks, is uh, with, with, you know, not I would say a massive amount of pressure. I think is is a very um, is a very telltale sign of, of what's happening. The the listserv for the new the campaign for New York Health, for instance, from January to right now, grew from five thousand to thirty thousand people in terms of in terms of their email reach, um, which is still far too little, um, but it, it gives you a sense of, of of where that moment is. You know, you have. Uh, places like uh, Newburgh, um, uh, New York, which it voted for Trump by 52 percent, um, that uh, at a recent town hall meeting of, a, of their sort of milk toast conservative Democratic Party uh, U.S. representative, were he was shouted down uh, from the floor around two major issues, the Pilgrim Pipeline, which is a frack gas pipeline, and, um, and single-payer health care. They, they had to basically move to a whole new uh, larger uh, facility to, 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 to facilitate this town hall discussion that really got out of hand and, and put pressure on it. So this, that's, the, that's the kind of political moment that we're in. Um, now, having said that, I think that, um, and one of the things I said in, in a recent Jacobin article that uh, I wrote in basically sort of dovetailing with some of the arguments that, that Dustin was making uh, in his articles is, you know, we're, it, I think it can be generally said that we're within striking distance of having a, a single parent. You know, Dustin puts it at six years. I, I, I think that that's a decent estimate. Uh, <laughs> I think that if we, if we do a number of things right, I think that's possible maybe sooner. We'll see. Um, but I think that we're not on the press. I think it's important to say that we're not on the precipice of victory. Um, and it's important to say that because I don't think that if we continue to do the things that we're doing right now just in more of and in a grander scale, that, that's, that's the path how we're going to get there. Um, and so, uh, like Dustin, I think it's important to identify some of the reasons why that is and, and some, of the, some of the sort of strategic watchwords that we want to, um, we want to be thinking about. One is that it's, you know, let's, let's not fool ourselves in, this, in the sense that the, the, the bills got within one or two votes of getting to the governor's desk. Those votes... Many of those votes were because it wasn't ever going to get to the governor's desk. And so there, what, what, uh, a classic you know, mainstream Democratic Party tactic is, yeah, absolutely, I'm for it, as long as I don't have to actually be for it, when, you know, when it, it, as long as there's no stakes for me, as long as I don't have to piss off the, the, the health insurance dude that just donated to my campaign you know, six months ago, because it's, it's been guaranteed not to happen. And Cuomo is very sophisticated about doing that, and so is Jerry Brown in New York and California. Um, you know, healthcare is a fifth of our gross domestic product um, economically. It's about 
Um, so the uh, profits of the pharmaceutical companies, the profits of the medical supply companies, the profits and the administrative costs of the health insurance companies, those are major chunks of our economy that aren't going to go away lightly. Um, the, the, health, the single payer doesn't existentially threaten the pharmaceutical and medical supply companies, but it does curtail their profits. And, and, and we want that to be the case because that's a major reason why um, those statistics were so striking in terms of health care costs uh, uh, in the United States that Dr. Fine was, was speaking of. Um, and I think, um, you know, we're talking about eradicating industries similar to the oil and gas industries that have such outsized influence in our political system. Um, so that, you know, it's all fun and games until you actually get to the point where you're really, you know, going to make this happen. We haven't really seen the level of opposition that we're going to see to single payer, either in New York or California. Um, I think actually Colorado is probably the better barometer because they did a ballot initiative. And that was a real threat because of the popularity of, of single payer. So the, the, the capitalist class freaked out in Colorado and threw hundreds of, uh, uh, of millions of dollars uh, on to the defeat of that bill, and it went down badly. Um, and we, our side was not prepared uh, for, for, that, for, that, um, for that fight. And so I think that we have to really, we have to really sort of think about what is it that's going to translate this moment, this opening, this possibility into a bona fide social movement, into a, a, a movement that breaches the national discussion in a way that we haven't seen before, um, which I definitely think is possible. Um, but I think it's going to take a whole range of things. I think I, I would very much agree with Dustin in terms of uh, single payer needing to have a national character. Uh, I said as much in, in, in the piece I wrote for Jackman. I think that um, it having a national character could mean a national march. We definitely need to be open to a national march. Uh, we definitely need to be thinking about how do we shape the national discussion, and a national march is a really good way to do that. Um, and a national march can't be counterposed to local organizing. In fact, in my experience, national marches can help really bolster uh, local organizing because it gains the issue a so much greater profile and gives people confidence so that they decide to spend time doing that work for the next year because of the excitement that gets generated by a national campaign. Um, and then even at the organizational level, specific organizations that decide to mobilize for a national mark then develop infrastructures within those organizations that then last beyond that national march that can, that can go into local organizing that I've, that I've seen very much firsthand. Um, so I don't think we need to be, we don't need to be opposed to it. We don't need to think of it as the magic bullet and we don't need to think of it as something that if it doesn't happen, we're all screwed or anything like that. Uh, but I do think that we need to be really thinking about how do we make this, uh, make this issue um, a one that is really uh, speaking to the hearts and minds of, of, of uh, tens of millions of people in this country and the way that it's on people's radar screens, but, it, but I think until it becomes more viable, I think that people aren't going to invest the time. And that, I mean, I am a part of a union of 37,000 nurses. A good amount of them are sympathetic to single payer, um, but nowhere near half are active in <laughs> organizing for single payer. Nowhere near more than a couple hundred are active in organizing for single payer right now. So just because we're, our organization is taking great positions, we fought the fight, but like the job of just our union to galvanize our own membership and to educate, agitate, and organize our own membership is a huge strategic initiative. And I think that we need to figure out how that, um, how that uh, uh, happens. And I think that uh, I'll just finish by saying um, I think some of the ways in which some of the things I think hamper those efforts. And one of them is I think um, uh, what happens oftentimes in November of every couple years. Um, and I think that is because uh, I, I've seen it quite a bit where, and, and, it, and it really has, um, it has a lot to do with, I think, the New York uh, state situation where you hear a lot about different issues, whether it's the single payer bill or the climate change bill in New York. It's like, well, we got really close, but our problem's in the Senate. We got really close, but our problem's in the Senate. And what it, what's implied by that is if we could only flip the Senate, meaning flip it from Republican to Democrat, then we're in the clear. And that is a trap. 
Um, that is, if we were to flip the center, first of all, in New York, there's the IDC, um, which is a triangulation mechanism that Cuomo uses to thwart uh, any progressive legislation. But the IDC is on paper for single payer. Um, so it's not, um, it's not like there's, there's going to be some magic bullet to just because you're a Democrat, you're going to be for single payer. Obviously, the Democratic Party as an institution has spent the last 40 years systematically not letting single payer onto the, the table. So the idea of just we need to flip the Senate is not going to be the approach that, that is going to win the day. We need to, we need to build power. Um, we need to build power. We need to build single payer committees in our workplaces. We need to build uh, community based organizations. The coalitions that are fighting for single payer need to open up and find out and figure out ways to draw in these new forces that are that are potentially uh, enthusiastic. And we need to we need to start finding very concrete things for people to do that will actually help raise the profile of this issue. Because I do think that. It is so desperately needed. When you look at things like Superstorm Sandy in New York, or Harvey in Houston, or Irma in Puerto Rico, um, and going into the Keys this weekend, like when you look at the desperate need and, and what it says about our healthcare infrastructure that so much devastation exists and is not able to be um, treated in a in a in a unified way by the health system, um, I think that there's there's so many ways in which. Uh, people and, and every any time you talk about health care, every family has a story about how devastating this health care system has been to their lives and oftentimes there 's three or four of those stories in every family so it's it 's something that if we can coalesce i think there's there 's massive potential for all the reasons that dustin said and i think i 'd be really i 'm really curious to hear what people uh, think about how to take this moment and turn it into a movement.